As much fun as it would be to barrel right ahead to talking about the transit of closure, we need to understand how to compose relations first, um, which is something you should be familiar with from algebra. Instead of thinking about composition of relations, well, let's think about composition of functions. So that's going to be basically the same thing. Um, we do the relation R first, and then we're going to follow it by the relation S, which is just like functions are composed in algebra. Um, we're going to use some different notation, though. Let R be a relation from X to Y, and let S be a relation from Y to Z. So here's the set X. We somehow pair up the elements of X to Y with R, and then we take the elements of Y and pair them up with the elements of the, the set Z by the relation S. And their composition is the new relation RS, whose elements are all those pairs X, Z, where there is some element of Y bridging the two of them. Um, we're going to write R squared instead of R composed with R, and we're going to recursively define R to the N to be R composed with R to the N minus 1. Uh, this operation is not commutative, meaning that RS does not need to equal SR. In fact, the existence of one does not even imply that the other exists. Um, be aware that some writers use the notation SR to refer to the set defined above. Um, so you remember that if you do in functions, when you do f then g, uh, you are used to writing that as g circle f. Uh, so when we do r then s, we're going to write it as rs. So we're going to kind of go backwards from what you're used to here notation-wise, um, but I promise uh, we're going to be happy we did in just a minute. All right, so let's get into an example. Let's let x be the set, x1, x2, x3. Let's let y be the set, y1, y2. And let's let z be the set, z1, z2, z3. Let's let r be the relation, x1, paired with y1, x2 paired with y2, and x3 paired with y2. And we're going to let s be the relation pairing y1 to z1 and z2, and y2 is going to be paired to z1. All right, so let's visualize this relation by drawing x, y, and z as sets. So here's the set x, here's the set y, and here's the set z. And in x, I've got the elements x1, x2, and x3. In y, I've got the elements y1 and y2. And in z, I've got the elements z1, z2, and z3. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw an arrow between any pairs x and y that are related by r and between any pairs x and z, uh, sorry, y and z that are related by s. So x1 is related to y1. x2 and x3 are both related to y2. Then y1 is related to both z1 and z2, and y2 is only related to z1. So rs is going to be the set of all pairs where there's a element of y acting as a bridge between an element of x and an element of z. So for example, since I can get between x1 and z1 via y1, I'm going to include the pair x1, z1 in my composition. I will also include the pairs x1, z2, also thanks to y1, the pair x2, z1, thanks to y2, and the pair x3, z1. Those are all four of the paths from x to y, or sorry, from x to z that y creates. 
uh, there's a comment here at the bottom. It says, equivalently, Rn is the set of all pairs x, y, in between which there is a path. I, of course, spelled the word there wrong. That's embarrassing. Between which there is a path of length n. Uh, I need to comment on that a little bit. There's a proof here. We're, there's a proof in this that we're not even doing. Um, but we can at least talk about it. So let's say that I'm in the relation R on the set x. And I have R relating this element to this element and the second element to the third element. I don't care what these elements are called. All right, so R is this relation and R is this relationship. Okay, well, if I run the relation R2, then what I'm doing is I'm doing this action on my set, and then I'm taking the second object to the third object. So in iterating on R twice, what I've done is I've linked the first and the third object together. So this dotted line here is going to be a member of R squared, and that generalizes if we have a bunch of elements that are related, so all these solid lines or arrows in R, then this blue line, all these blue lines are members of R2, All these green lines are going to be members of R3. This red line is going to be a member of R4. And this last dotted black line here is going to be um, a member of R6. Or R5. So black lines are R, blue lines are R squared, green lines are R cubed, red line is R4, and the dotted black line is a member of R5. It's a little obnoxious, that's supposed to be R5. Now you're starting to see how composition can maybe relate to transitivity. It would be annoying if we had to draw that diagram every single time we wanted to find a composition. Uh, thankfully, Boolean matrices are here to make this process simpler. Let R and S be relations whose matrices are MR and MS. Let their composition RS exist and have matrix M sub RS then the matrix for the composition is the product of the matrices for the individual relations. This is why multiplication is so hard. Matrix multiplication is defined to represent um, a, a, some, uh, some kind of combining of the objects that matrices are meant to represent. So remember, matrices always represent some sort of more abstract object, so multiplication of matrices should somehow represent combinations of those objects. Um, this is the same thing in real number matrices with linear transformations. Um, so let's have that same example as before. So the matrix for R is going to be the 3 by 2 matrix. Notice my first row corresponds to x1, my second corresponds to x2, my third corresponds to x3, my first column with y1, my second column with y2. So x1 is related to y1 but not y2, x2 is related to y2 but not y1, same with x3. And then my matrix for S is the 2 by 3 matrix, where these are the Ys and these are the Zs. You don't have to draw these uh, legends every time. You can just, I'm just doing it for easy reference. Um, and then our first row is the things that Y1 is related to, which is Z1 and Z2, but not Z3. And Y2 is related to Z1 and nothing else. So we take the matrix MR and multiply it by the matrix MS, which gives us a three by two matrix being multiplied by a two by three matrix. Notice that the inner numbers match because they are both the cardinality of the set Y. That's why those dimensions have to match when you're doing matrix multiplication. 
and then our result is the 3 by 3 matrix, number of elements in X times number of elements in Z. 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. And if you look back at what RS was, this is exactly the matrix for R composed with S. Before we move on, I want to make a comment here relating this process to something we talked about earlier. The first row of MR is 1, 0, which represents the quantified statement P of K, which is X1 is related to YK. Alright, so since x1 is related to y1, we have a 1 in the first position. Since x1 is not related to y2, we put a 0 in the second position. The column 1, 1 represents the statement q of k, which is the statement that yk is related to z1. This is the first column of the second matrix. It is a 1 because um, both, it is 1 in both first and second position because both y1 and y2 are related to z1. The reason that their Boolean dot product is equal to 1 is because the statement p of 1 and q of 1 is true. If both p of 1 and q of 1 had been false and p of, 1, p of 2 and q of 2 had been false, um, then the Boolean dot product would have been 0. But that's, that's what this matrix multiplication is doing, is it's making sure there is a y that both the x and the z are related to.